Welcome to uh, our Haldane Lecture this year. My name is John Agar. I'm co-head of department with Eric Tobin. Um, I'm just going to say a very few words, um, basically to say welcome. Um, if you're not from the Department of Science and Technology Studies, an extra big welcome. Um, we are a department that actually we've been celebrating over the last year our centenary. We've, we've been for 100 years uh, investigating how science and technology fits into the broader society and the broader world of ideas and problems and issues in history and philosophy of science, in studies of science policy and in particular also science communication and studies of public engagement. Um, and our Haldane lectures, which are semi-regular, we like to have one about one a year, but the broad idea is in our Haldane lectures we like to invite someone that we've been reading their work, we've been following their ideas, we've been talking about them uh, for, for ages because we think that they are outstanding scholars in our field. And that in our Haldane lectures what we do is we like to present and these people and their ideas to a broader audience as well as uh, continuing the conversation within the Department of Science and Technology Studies about the things we like to talk about. Um, and we're absolutely delighted that uh, today we're joined by uh, Sarah Davies from, uh, uh, from Vienna and I'm going to pass you on now to uh, Stephen Hughes, my colleague, who will uh, say a little bit more about um, Sarah. Uh, I think he's also going to mention our fantastic new MSc in science communication um, a little bit as well, because that's one of our big, big things that's happened this year. So over to Stephen, uh, but again, welcome everyone, and looking forward to hearing the fantastic talk. Yeah, for the quick answer, Sasha, it's like, oh, it's um, But yeah. Uh, oh, hi everyone, I'm Stephen, uh, Stephen Hughes, I'm a lecturer in the department uh, and I am really excited to welcome Professor Sarah Davies today to give our Haldane lecture. Uh, I've been a fan of her work for a lot of years uh, at this stage and any of my students that are here will definitely know that I'm a fan of her work because I'm constantly asking them to read her texts. Um, and yeah, really excited for this talk. Uh, I think we're all going to learn uh, quite a lot today. So just a very, very brief background um, on Sarah. She is Professor of Techno Sciences, Materiality and Digital Cultures at the University of Vienna in Austria. Uh, and she studies everything at the interface of science and society and the various relationships that happen there and all of the really juicy, interesting issues that emerge when we start to study scientists and scientific activity when it comes up against society more broadly. Her work on science communication and emotion, the role of emotion in science communication and responsibility and integrity in research cultures uh, has been really, really uh, useful and inspirational for me. She was the examiner on my PhD um, and very kindly allowed me to pass with some uh, revisions where I needed to clarify a few points where I was just kind of going, so is your technical imaginaries, and just gesturing vaguely at some things. So uh, she very kindly pulled me up on a few things that you really need to kind of talk about this in a bit more detail. Um, but it was really, really uh, helpful. I think her work on emotion and science communication has been pretty groundbreaking, you know, people up until then have not really been talking about it within academic STS and science communication and she really like opened up the discourse and allowed a lot of people to talk about that so I think that's one major achievement that I found super useful. Um, also her book that she wrote with my horse, The Science Communication, uh, Culture, Identity and Citizenship, I just think it's an absolutely amazing introduction to science communication. I'm always plugging that book, it's the sort of first text I get students to read. I think it's an amazing introduction to the core ideas, the core principles, the issues that really matter. Uh, and I think it's super accessible, so, you know, students can read it, you know, experienced scholars can read it, and people who are just kind of interested in science communication can read it, so I think it's brilliant. 
I think that Sarah is really brilliantly positioned to deliver the Haldane lecture because she's really uniquely positioned right at the interface of kind of STS and all of the things that you know we care about in STS and also science communication um, as well. Uh, I mean, I I was to just just kind of preparing for this. I was like on Google Scholar and I was like Sarah Davies, you know, typed in and it was just like publication after publication. I was like show more the next 20 publications. <laughs> oh my God, show more! It's like over a hundred. I was like. This person is just writing all the time, and I had lunch with her earlier, and I was like, what is the secret? <laughs> How do you just publish so much stuff? It's amazing, and all of it is such good quality as well. Um, and, you know, her research found so many interesting things. She looks at, like, she's looked at public engagement with nanotechnology, with biohacking, with maker spaces. She's looked at responsibility, care, and integrity in research cultures. Uh, she's been looking at really interesting stuff around look and how uh, scientists understand the work that they do uh, around serendipity and look. It's super interesting stuff. Um, and of course, she's been thinking more recently about what you know what is the role of SDS and science communication in the research landscape more broadly. And I'm really really interested to um, to hear what uh, Sarah's going to say about this today. Uh, it's also a pleasure to have science communication and a, an expert in science communication as the focus for this year's lecture, um, as it also marks the start of our MSc in science communication, which uh, John mentioned earlier. It's the first time that it's running, uh, and we have loads of our students here in the audience as well, and we're really excited um, to have them here as well for this lecture. Uh, if anyone's actually interested in learning a little more about it, you can speak to Melanie and Jean-Baptiste. Um, afterwards. So we're absolutely thrilled and honoured to have Professor Davies with us here today to share her insights and knowledge on what she has called the social conversation around science. So please join me in welcoming Sarah to the stage. And Stephen, just so you know, the challenge wasn't letting me pass your PhD, it was persuading you how amazing it was, <laughs> and that you really didn't have to do too much more work uh, on it. Um, yeah, it's really a delight, particularly to be back in London, where I did my PhD, finishing in 2007. It's a little intimidating, I have to say, to see uh, colleagues uh, again. Um, I also feel a bit self-conscious. I've lived away from the UK since 2009. My family tell me my accent is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Having lived in the US and now in Austria and Denmark. So yeah, I'm sorry. Please feel free to make fun of me. <laughs> um, yes. So as you've heard and seen, my uh, title is What Societies Does Science Communication Make? democracy, persuasion, and the productivity of a public communication. Um, and before I go into talking about um, those topics, so I wanted actually to start by just positioning myself um, in the networks of which I'm part, acknowledging the uh, colleagues and scholars whose work I engage with and draw on, particularly my colleagues, uh, my close colleagues at the University of Vienna, but also more generally. Academic work is never uh, solitary work, it's never the work of low genius, is it? Genie? Genie? Um, uh, and so it's really important for me to acknowledge the ways in which I draw on these networks um, uh, and these colleagues and my students as well. I learn huge amounts from my students um, and I guess those teaching the, the master's programs here are doing so as well. So I was thinking for a while about um, how to get into that title that I've just uh, shared with you, what societies does science communication make? Um, I was thinking about how to start, how to begin, how to um, start diving into that content. So I quite recently gave my inaugural lecture at the University of Vienna. Yeah, very big deal. Um, and as I was preparing for that, a colleague gave me some advice and some feedback on the content. And one thing that she told me was not ever to start with a quote uh, from, from scholarly literature, and in particular not to start with a quote from Latour. <laughs> what I had done. Uh, so that lecture got changed, 
Um, and she told me you should always start with an anecdote. Okay, good advice. Uh, unfortunately for this talk, I have been racking my brains for the last two months for a juicy, engaging, exciting, relevant anecdote or vignette. Um, and I just couldn't think of anything. I thought about making something up. I thought, no, that's, that's unethical. <laughs> Uh, so instead, I'm afraid I don't have an anecdote, but I will begin with two questions and a starting assumption. Uh, so my first question is this, what is the point of public communication of science? So what is its purpose? So in many ways, this is perhaps a banal question. I guess that um, anyone here in the audience today will have some answers to that, whether from their own practice or from uh, thinking about the role of science communication in society. Uh, and this, of course, might be a range of things, from sharing a sense of wonder and excitement of the natural world to inspiring the next generation of researchers. One of the things that I want to do in this talk, though, is to step back, perhaps, from immediate motivations and think more generally about this question in the context of wider society. So not only what is the point of public communication, for us as individuals, as communicators, but what is its role and place in societies as a whole? The second question is related in that it asks not what science communication is for, but what it actually does. So what does science communication bring into being? What does it do to the world? Again, uh, maybe something that we can think of very obvious and immediate answers to. So I guess anyone who has evaluated science communication practice or thought about evaluation has spent a lot of time thinking about what it means to um, understand impacts and effects and try and measure these, whether those are on public audiences or science and scientists or on policy. So again, though, I want to step back from these immediate impacts and effects that we might capture or try and capture in evaluation processes um, and I want to do this in part through the starting assumption that I have for this talk. Uh, so this is that science communication is something that is productive or generative um, or um, constitutive. Um, so it is something that does not simply describe particular scientific ideas or worlds, but always intervenes in them. It always brings new things into being. Uh, so in taking this view of science communication, I am drawing on science and technology studies ideas in particular about the reality generating nature of practices. So for instance, the ways in which public engagements uh, help to constitute the publics that they engage. And it's here that I could but will not quote Latour uh, as an example of these kinds of ideas. We can talk about that perhaps more um, later on. For now, I just want to take this as a starting point, uh, that we will think about science communication as performative, as, change, as changing the world, uh, often in unexpected ways. So these questions and that assumption give some sense, I hope, of the kind of issues I want to consider over the course of the next um, 40 minutes or so. Uh, this is where we are going more concretely. I want to start with that first question, what is the point of science communication? Um, and to think about how we might develop a language for talking about the purposes of public communication uh, so a way of framing its role in society, and kind of offering categories and terms for thinking about that. I then, however, want to step back. In SDS, I feel like we're always stepping back, <laughs> always uh, recontextualizing. As I want to step back from that language and critically analyze or deconstruct it a little bit, and to think about um, what the, the categories and ideas of that language uh, tell us about imaginations of society, and in particular of uh, democracy. And in my final um, section, I want to uh, consider some possible answers to that second question of what is being done through instances of science communication. So to ask the question that I, I have in my title, 
what kinds of societies or versions of science are brought into being through public communication. So before I start talking about the, any of those things, however, there are a couple of um, uh, background, pieces of background that I want to, to mention. So first of all, what am I talking about? What do I mean when I use this term of science communication? Uh, so essentially, I am drawing on a definition from um, a book chapter that my host and Alan and Owen and I wrote which uh, argues that science communication can be understood as organized, explicit, and intended actions that aim to communicate scientific knowledge, methodology, processes, or practices in settings where non-scientists are a recognized part of the audiences. Uh, so this is not a perfect definition. Uh, every time I use it, I get frustrated with it. I think one of the problems, or one of the challenges, is that this uh, distinction between settings where non-scientists are present and scientists are present is increasingly blurred in this age of open science, um, open data, open innovation. But what I do like about the definition is that it emphasizes that the science communication that I will talk about at least focuses on um, intended and organized practices that have somewhere the aim to communicate or to engage people around aspects of science. That might be content, it might be facts, but it might also be ideas about scientific processes or uh, the culture of science, what it's like to be a scientist, um, what it is, uh, uh, what the day-to-day -day activities of research involve. And I also like it because it is rather broad. Uh, it captures many different kinds of activities, whether that is kind of dialogue and participation and deliberative events, um, science in the mainstream media, uh, protest and activism, popular science on TV or in books, science in museums, uh, and um, public health information, for example. So when I talk about science communication, I'm talking about all of these different kinds of activities, um, both dialogic and participatory, and those that take more traditional forms. The second piece of background uh, is the material that I am drawing on uh, when I, I make these arguments. So in particular here, I am using findings from uh, a study carried, study carried out uh, as part of a European project, Quest, uh, which finished a couple of years ago, uh, but that involved uh, both a literature survey and interviews with science communication teachers and scholars across Europe. Uh, so it was a European project that had a focus on Europe specifically. And in the interview study, we asked people about a range of different things, uh, including their views on the landscape of science communication and the societal role and value of it. Um, if you're interested, um, there are a couple of publications um, that talk about uh, this work in more detail. Uh, and you're very welcome to go to the project website as well. So it's this combination of literature and um, the interviews uh, which I'm using uh, for the first part of this presentation in talking about how we might develop a language, how we might think about the role of science communication uh, in society. Uh, what we found when we looked at those interviews and the, the literature material was um, a set of six clusters or themes or patterns uh, that boiled down to different ways of framing the societal purpose or value of science communication. And it's these that I will um, speak about um, briefly. So the first cluster or set of answers um, to the question, what is the point of science communication, circled around ideas of accountability, legitimacy, and responsibility. Uh, so this was present, for instance, uh, as in the quote on the screen, the idea that science, that research is publicly funded, um, and that those who receive public funding for their research 
have a duty to explain how that money is spent. Uh, so these answers kind of speak to the notion of some kind of social contract between science and society, that if research is funded from the public purse, um, then we are accountable to publics. If we are to be legitimate, we need to be transparent, and we have a responsibility um, to open up uh, the products of our knowledge to, to audiences. So there's some kind of contract in place where there is a responsibility or a duty to communicate. So this was one idea. A second theme or set of ideas circled around notions of democracy. Uh, so this was often tied to ideas of science communication as dialogic, as um, enabling participation and democratic engagement with science. Uh, so in the quote on the screen, there's a reference to deliberation specifically. The way that I see science communication, it's about deliberation on how knowledge is being produced, created, transferred in a society today. Um, so again, some notion of a social contract, but here the idea of democracy, of the involvement of the wider populace is much more present. Um, so this could be explicitly around deliberation and participation. Uh, if we're in a democratic society, if we believe that science should be democratically governed, then there is a need to engage broad publics uh, and talk about priorities um, and the directions and trajectories of research. But these ideas of democracy were also more um, expressed in kind of less intensely normative ways, we might say. It was also the idea that science communication played a role in equipping and empowering citizens, um, allowing people to access knowledge that enabled them to make good decisions um, in voting, for instance, enabling them to um, uh, hold science to account, um, to criticize um, bad scientific practices, or to get engaged with scientific controversies. So here science communication was seen as equipping people, allowing them to act as uh, good citizens. Uh, and the same was true for politicians. Uh, there was this idea that science communication was important for democracy because it was also informing and equipping, maybe not empowering, uh, politicians. Uh, it was something that could be an input into policy processes. And finally, the notion of critical debate was important within this cluster of responses. So there was a sense that science should be held account, uh, should be held to account by society, by uh, publics, that there was a need for debate and discussion that questioned science and the directions that it was going, uh, and that science communication could help this happen. Um, so a few people in this context mentioned science journalism. Uh, there was often a sense that science journalism was under threat, and in particular, a kind of science journalism that was investigative, um, that wasn't simply um, uh, reproducing press releases, that involved um, long-term uh, investigation and interrogation of um, science in cases where science and technology had um, power. So all of these things somehow speak to an idea and imagination of democratic society and the role of science communication in assisting and nurturing that. however, of more instrumental purposes for science communication. And the idea um, simply that science could be useful to people um, and that also public views and ideas could be useful to science and to research. Uh, so here in the quote, um, the idea that um, what science can bring is a quality at the level of knowledge production that hardly any other fields of society can bring getting that knowledge into many individual and institutional or societal decisions is important. Uh, so here there's the notion that science communication again equips citizens, it helps them to make good choices and decisions, or it helps us I should say to make good choices and decisions um, in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so uh, topics such as vaccination uh, were mentioned in this context 
um, how can we make um, robust choices based on scientific knowledge. We need uh, that knowledge to be communicated to us. Um, yeah, as is suggested by the notion of uh, institutional decisions, uh, again, the notion of policy was important here. Uh, is that politicians also need to make good choices, they need to understand the evidence that is available. And finally, there, as part of this instrumental um, way of valuing science communication, science and research itself was seen as benefiting from science communication, particularly those forms that are dialogic or that involve engagement with other publics. So researchers might gain useful knowledge from their engagement with um, different public audiences, whether that is very specific audiences like users of their research or whether that is simply getting a sense of perspective, a different angle on their, their work. So here in all of these things there is a practicality to science communication and uh, instrumental value to it. As a fourth category, um, we found ideas loosely around culture and the cultural value and pleasures of science and research. Um, so here, this was, um, for example, the idea of science being one of humanity's greatest achievements. Um, it's a set of social institutions that's grown up over many centuries that deserves critical attention. It is an achievement. It is something that is valuable or that provides access to things that are beautiful and um, uh, allow for, for pleasure. So in this context, um, there was the language of uh, a social achievement, a cultural achievement, uh, but there was also a comparison sometimes made with art uh, or music and these forms of um, knowing and, and modes of expression. Uh, so if we as societies value art, if we find that there is something wonderful, pleasurable about it that people should be able to, to access, um, then in this line of argument, the same is true of science. It is something good that people should be able to enjoy. So these four rationales or arguments or ways of framing the value of science communication, I guess these are all at least somewhat familiar. And these were definitely very present, both in the literature that we looked at and in the interview. The final two categories or ways of thinking about the value of science communication are more kind of sticky in the empirical material. Um, they were things that were framed in not quite so such clear-cut ways. Such as this one, this idea that um, science communication, one of its roles is marketing and promotion. So this was different in that this was framed uh, entirely in negative terms in the interviews. Uh, so several of our interviewees spoke about concerns that science communication was becoming too promotional, it was becoming too superficial, it was too much like uh, cheerleading. Um, and I'm sorry to say that university press offices were um, the key culprit that people mentioned here. Uh, so you can see in the quotes, um, the, the interviewee, the speaker, is talking about their discomfort with this notion of image comp competition, competitivity in science. So all universities or all institutions have a communication department not to be more close to people, which is somehow the ideal version of science communication that they were speaking about, but rather to make their own advertisement trying to attract stakeholders and money uh, and so on. So this form, uh, or this way of thinking about science communication, it was something that was very much present in the interviews, it was something that people spoke about, but they were often concerned uh, about this. Uh, so they framed it negatively. It had a role, but they were very hesitant about the value of that role. Uh, and I think um, we can tie that version of science communication to um, some writing by Susanna Priest about different forms of, of science communication, and in particular, 
a distinction that she makes between uh, strategic science communication or what she calls strategic science communication on the one hand and democratic science communication on the other. Uh, and she talks about strategic communication, um, strategic science communication as being oriented to persuasion. Uh, so to convincing people of particular things and in particular wanting to change their behaviors in particular ways. And she talks about this in contrast to democratic science communication, um, which is much more related to the ideas that I've talked about, ideas of accountability, <coughs> or of uh, enhancing democratic engagement with science. So this uh, marketing and promotion um, is present in, in the material and is something that Priest identifies and discusses, um, but there's some hesitation uh, about it, and that's something I will come back to um, in a few minutes. Um, so, fi a final category <coughs> that was very little present in the empirical material uh, that I'm talking about, but that is in the literature and I think is also present in um, wider public and policy discourse, is an economic rationale for science communication. So here I quote uh, Jonathan Osborne uh, in a book that uh, he and Justin uh, edited some years ago. Uh, when um, Oswald is talking about different rationales for science education and he pulls out this economic um, purpose, this economic value and says that in these discussions, these policy discussions, there is the idea that an advanced technological society needs a constant supply of scientists to sustain its economic base. So here we have ideas about um, the role of science and technology in um, uh, the economic well-being of societies. So notions that we increasingly live in innovation societies, this is what drives economic productivity. If that is the case, then we need people both to do the innovating, people with training in science and technology, and we also need um, a workforce who are able to engage and use these technologies. So a very pragmatic argument about um, the need for science communication in equipping uh, the workforce, essentially, and ensuring economic well-being of nations. It's worth saying, perhaps, that not only was this very little present in um, our interviews, uh, this is also a rationale that Osborne kind of rejects um, in looking at the, the evidence around uh, how innovation happens and how people are equipped to participate in it. So that is a flavor of these six um, rationales, these six categories or ways of talking about the, the point of science communication, how it fits into our societies. So this, of course, is based on rather the limited uh, material, definitely limited empirical material, um, and, um, and literature serves it as limited in its English language and uh, scholarly. Uh, and so I'm a little hesitant about proposing this as some kind of unified theory for thinking about the value of science communication. As I said, they do perhaps, these categories perhaps help us um, think about how to, to talk about the wider purposes of science communication that provides uh, a language or a starting point for a language. But these roles, these categories should be uh, understood as non-exclusive, um, overlapping and non-normative. So in practice, of course, if we think about any instance of science communication, many or several of these rationales will be at play. Um, I also don't think we should necessarily take them as, as normative, despite the hesitations around um, marketing. I think we don't have to say um, that this is negative. Rather, uh, these uh, categories are a frame for thinking about um, the purposes of science communication. And I say that they are not exclusive because I am really curious if we can think of others, um, other ways of framing the value and the role of public communication of science. Yes, so what is missing? What would be added if we looked and talked to different communities, if we, for instance, engaged with citizens about um, how they think the, uh, the point and purpose of science communication uh, should be understood? One reason that I 
think this language is interesting, though, um, and as a starting point, perhaps, uh, for further investigation and analysis, is that we can, uh, as always, step back a little bit from them. We can uh, deconstruct them, unpack them, and examine the kinds of assumptions um, that lie behind them. In particular, I think, we can see these six categories or rationales as somehow fundamentally relating to ideas about the kinds of societies we want to, to live in together. Um, so as they are discussed, they point to ideas about um, democracy in particular. So several of these categories, these rationales, um, emphasize notions of democracy and democratic engagement with science. So the importance of critical debate, for instance, the idea that a public sphere debate about science and technology is necessary and important. The ideas of accountability and legitimacy that I started with, and of course also this explicit mention of deliberation and participation, all of these things point to an imagination, an idea that we live or want to live in democratic societies where citizens are able to participate um, somehow in political choices and decisions. So there is an assumption there um, that we, um, we live in democracies and the science communication has an important part to play in such democracies. Again, um, this relates to the rather limited sample, uh, the rather limited set of material that I'm drawing on, because of course there are many societies or um, that are not democratic in their form, or that um, operate in um, operate using forms of democracy that are not complete or idealized. Uh, and we can think there again about well, what is the place of science communication there? How do we think about that? Are science and science communication somehow um, implicitly, in, intrinsically tied to notions of democracy or not? There is also um, an idea circulating in these assumptions that we live or we want to live in equitable societies. We want public goods to be shared. They should be accessible to as many people as possible. So we see this, for instance, in these ideas and arguments about science as culture, uh, something that is beautiful and wonderful that should be accessible to people. But we also see this in um, discussions of the, the economic benefits of science communication. So things that are good, whether that is an emotional experience of awe and wonder at the natural world or economic development, these should be made available to as many people as possible. So, what this means, I think, is that at least according to this material, um, science communication, one of the things that it should do, one of the ways that it should um, act in the world is to produce better democratic engagement around science and more equitable access to it. And I want to talk about that idea in more detail. Um, but I, as an aside, I, I want to say a couple of words about um, what this means for our science communication practice. I guess many people in the room are people who do uh, communicate science, who um, are interested in, in carrying that out and developing skills uh, in that. And I think for practitioners, for, for those of us who carry out science communication, one of the implications is that our science communication activities are important. Um, Maybe this is obvious to you. I think sometimes as practitioners operating under um, tight budget conditions or in a hurry, um, it's easy to get sucked into the immediate and to, to see our activities perhaps as mundane. What these ideas teach us, I think, is that we are reinforcing particular ideas about how our society should function when we do science communication whether that is relating to democracy or to the value, the cultural value of science. Uh, this means, 
um, that even though we will have immediate rationales, we will all have answers to this question, what is the point of my science communication? It is also, I think, important to, to value what we do in the context of its societal impact. Um, yeah, science communication is not only an end in itself, it is not only about communicating science, um, but doing something to our societies. Uh, and I think reframing our activities uh, in this way can help us to, to see how important they are. Another aside, um, I said I'd come back to the notion of strategic communication. I, I think perhaps our interviewees were too harsh um, in writing off this form of science communication and in framing all kind of marketing and promotional activities as, as superficial, um, particularly in regards to how this relates to persuasion and to this notion of strategic communication. Uh, and it opens up the question, um, or something for, for us to reflect on, I think, is what role exactly does persuasion play in particular contexts? If we make this distinction between democratic science communication and strategic science communication, as Susanna Priest does, then how can we think about um, this persuasion-oriented science communication? Does it have a role, for instance, in times of crisis? I don't answer that question, I leave it for the discussion. Okay, um, so just to, to pause and to see where we have come to with regard to my questions and assumption. Uh, what is the point of public communication of science? Um, so the language that I've talked about, that I've identified, teaches us I think that there are at the very least a range of purposes that relate somehow to ideas and imaginations of the kinds of societies we wish to live in. What does public communication of science bring into being? According to this language, according to this material, what it should bring into being is democratic and equitable engagement with science. However, to move away from this rather idealized um, categorization, uh, this imagined version of science communication and its role, um, what happens if we, we look more um, at, at, at the implications of this starting assumption? Um, so if we say, yes, science communication is always an intervention. Um, we have one answer um, in terms of what is being brought into being. We have an ideal answer, answer of democratic and equitable engagement with science. But I think this starting assumption um, brings us to, to ask more concretely what in practice is being brought into being through science communication. What do different forms of science communication practice enact in the world? What do they perform? Is it democratic and equitable engagement with science, or is it something else? So in the remaining few minutes, um, yes, it's, it's great. I've got a clock on the screen. Um, yeah, in the remaining few minutes, we'll be done by six, I think, or I will be done by six. Um, I want to speculate, really, um, in thinking about the, the empirics of this question. If this notion of democratic and equitable engagement with science is somehow the idealized version, the idealized imagination of science communications role, um, then what could we think about um, if we look at science communication practice? What is science communication generating? Um, so this is an empirical question. Um, what are different forms and instances of public communication doing, producing, enacting? Um, is it democracy and equity, or is it other things as well? And this, I should say, is also to me very much an open question. This is not something I have studied systematically. Um, these are some snapshots and ideas um, of how I might start to answer this question. And I really invite 
people to um, give me other snapshots and ideas and also to, to do research uh, into this. Um, yeah, so I have some snapshots, uh, a few ideas. I should say it was not deliberate, but I found myself drawing on the work of many colleagues here at UCL, as I mentioned. Um, yeah, a couple of things that I think we know from existing scholarship of science communication about what is being enacted or performed by science communication practice. So I start by um, referring to Emily's work. It seems very obvious, I think, now, based on the literature we have, the scholarship that we have, that in practice, much science communication um, does not enact equitable engagement with science, but assumes and reproduces a profoundly limited public participant. It enacts inequality. It allows some people to be um, understood as part of science, as rightly having access to science, and it excludes others. Uh, so in particular, we see repeatedly the ways in which science communication is done as a white and middle class um, activity, and the ways in which um, particular uh, communities, particular identities, are not only kind of accidentally ignored, but actively uh, excluded from uh, ideas and imaginations about what science and research is. Science communication, in many cases, in many sites, uh, and I speak about my um, speak from my knowledge of um, Vienna and Austria, as well as from the, the literature. Uh, science communication continues to be something that is really done for a particular kind of, of person, um, and that is not allowing others um, to be part of science. Uh, based on this knowledge based on the scholarship, I think it is then vitally important to reflect on whether particular um, science communication practices are in fact helping to achieve equity or whether they are, to quote Emily, uh, giving a superficial appearance of accessibility. Um, yeah, the images from a museum in Vienna that held um, what was ostensibly a public event that was, of course, um, a very particular kind of public being done in that space. So perhaps science communication <coughs> practice is uh, at least some of the time enacting, performing, in inequality, bringing that into the world. I think perhaps we might also think about the ways in which science communication reproduces, reinforces, performs a version of academia that we can frame as academic capitalism. So this is the notion in the scholarly, scholarly literature uh, that academia is increasingly, or perhaps now almost entirely, um, organized and populated by ideas of um, markets, the value of markets, um, the need for competition. So capitalist logics being imposed on academic practice. This, I guess, is um, a hot topic here in the UK at the moment uh, with all the kind of um, yeah, concerns about the neoliberal university, uh, what that is doing to scholarship. Under conditions of academic capitalism, and I guess this is something that, that we all experience and feel that we live under, under these conditions there is a constant need to sell our scholarship, to sell ourselves as a brand, to be competitive in a global market. One of the implications of this is that many, for many researchers, um, public communication is or is framed as another way to become more competitive in academic job markets. Um, we see this sometimes in training uh, for scientists uh, in science communication. The training that uh, people are given, at least some of the time, is not about doing these more um, dialogic forms of engagement. It is not even about um, being reflective and learning from science communication practice. It's about having a brand, it's having the right kind of social media presence, um, and it's uh, about selling yourself, um, being visible, uh, and making you more competitive. So using your lab website to make a compelling first impression. 
Well, we kind of, talk, of course, talk about the pros and cons and the, the need or otherwise for this form of communication. But I think we can say at least um, that this is reinforcing the kind of thriving promotional regime around <coughs> research in which hype and promising are central, in which research is about funding, about money, about capitalist logics of competition, uh, and about winning in this um, competitive market. I think we can also say that such communication performs a particular version of science and scientists, one where we all succeed all the time, for instance, where we don't fail uh, and we don't struggle. Um, yeah, and we kind of, of course, again, go back to this notion of strategic science communication and perhaps think about this uh, in the context of, um, of that idea. Another thing that perhaps science communication is doing, um, this is actually very different, it kind of flips the focus onto um, uh, those who consume science communication. And here I am drawing on some of my own work in progress, um, uh, which involves looking at science content on Facebook. It's collaboration with colleagues um, in Venice and also at City University. Um, I, and it involves looking at a, a data set of science content on Facebook uh, and simply looking at what is being done, what is being performed or practiced by um, the comments on this kind of content. Um, so that's the, the coding scheme uh, on, the, on the screen there. I have to say, I do not wish um, a research project where you code Facebook uh, <laughs> comments on any of you. Um, and it's very interesting, ultimately, but it's also slightly terrifying. Um, but one interesting thing is that the, the code um, that is most dominant is simply tagging friends. Uh, so many of the comments, many of the engagements uh, with scientific content on Facebook at least is um, relating to somebody in your, your social network. And this is very much in line with Oliver Martin's fantastic PhD um, where he looked at um, I fucking love science as well as some other sites um, and again looked at what was going on there. What was um, the purpose of these practices of engagement with this um, scientific content. And he argues that performing science and not science, so the distinctions made between uh, what should and shouldn't be called science uh, on social media, this was used to satisfy emotional needs, such as displaying a desired social identity and or creating a sense of uh, community. So the key point in both these uh, empirical snapshots is that actually in these cases, engagement with science, um, using science communication, was much less about scientific content per se, um, and particularly not with its role in democratic societies, and much more with um, individual needs and desires. So when I tag somebody, I reinforce my social network, I um, uh, communicate with them, uh, I um, build and reinforce a sense of community. And in um, Oliver Marshall's study as well, uh, he found that people were engaging with science on these platforms and sites, um, not only for the scientific knowledge that was there, that was available, to, but to present themselves as a particular kind of person and to network, to build community with other like-minded people. So these um, are needs, these are uses of science communication um, that rather little perform or enact democracy and much more perform or enact versions of uh, consumption. Uh, and I, I say that this reinforces consumer societies um, not as a criticism, but as uh, but using the cultural studies notion of consumption as an active practice that can be used for, for meaning making in people's lives and in wider uh, contexts. So this is not a criticism, this is not a negative thing to say that science communication is part of consumer societies. Um, it is just to observe one way in which science 
uh, scientific knowledge and science communication is claimed, is appropriated by non-scientists and used for particular personal purposes. So I, I um, keep waving my hand around and knocking the microphone, trying not to do that. Okay, finally, if we start to think about what is being done by science communication, what is being performed, um, here we might draw on work um, by David Kirby, by Eric Stengler, that has reflected on the ways in which science is framed in much science communication. So David Kirby um, argued that um, a lot of science communication, in particular he pointed to the Cosmos TV show, um, emphasizes affects of awe and wonder. Um, so the science communication in presenting the natural world and science's ability to access it um, sought to generate, to um, produce uh, these kinds of affects that relate very much to, to religious terms. Um, so here science is done as something that is um, an almost religious experience. Somewhat relatedly, Eric Schengler has talked about um, science communication um, that presents science as being fun. So I guess we can all think of the science shows, um, the performances, the ways of presenting science as something that's lively, um, that's active, that involves fire and explosions, and that is a fun uh, and inspiring practice. And Stengler says, um, well, this is fine. Maybe it excites people, it gets people interested, but it is not, in fact, an accurate representation of uh, mundane uh, research practice. This is not something we should be telling people um, they are getting into when they pursue a scientific career. There are rather limited explosions in everyday research practice. Oh my, anyway. Um, so these are kind of different, different arguments, they, but they both focus on the way in which science is performed in uh, particular instances of public communication. And in both cases, we can critically analyze um, uh, the way in which science is done. Uh, we can ask, um, not only is it accurate or inaccurate, but can and should it be otherwise? How is science not being made in these kinds of representations and performances? And what, um, what might we really be concerned about with regard to that? Here, I guess, I think also of, of critiques of the science that remains invisible um, in popular culture. So science that is funded by the, the military, for instance. Um, science that is populated by a diverse range of identities and bodies and practices. Often these, type, these versions of science, these performances of science, uh, are less obvious in science communication. Uh, yeah, how can we think about that? Could it be otherwise? Should it be otherwise? So as I said, these are snapshots. Um, they are not meant to be representative. Uh, they are scratching the surface of the diversity of science communication practice. And I think if we take these arguments seriously, um, then we need to focus on the specificities of science communication to ask what not what is being done by science communication as a whole, but, but what is being done by particular instances of science communication. So my central point or my central suggestion is not to say that these ideas of science communication as enacting acad academic capitalism or consumption, uh, that is not universal. Uh, I don't want to argue that, but rather I think that it is interesting and important to interrogate what is being done by particular forms and cases of science communication. Um, so to use the language of Donna Haraway, what is being, being worlded by these activities. And I think to come back to this language that I, I introduced at the start, I think it's important to examine what is being done, what is being worlded in the context of our aims uh, for public communication of science uh, and the ways in which these relate to our imaginations of our societies. Um, so my closing question uh, for discussion for future research 
um, is exactly what societies does particular forms of science communication make, and how could and should this be otherwise? How can we imagine other science communications, other ways of doing science communication that bring other things into being than perhaps what is done uh, in much more daily practice? It's six o'clock on the dot. I am really proud of myself. Um, thank you so much for your patience and attention. The microphone thing, but it doesn't seem to work. Yeah, yeah, it does yeah, seem to work. Yeah. So we're doing it. Okay, we're doing the microphone. Uh, so everyone will still hear it. Uh, so we have this room until 